Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. A look into South Korea reveals a confusing number of influences. The society is commonly described as Confucian. The politics are clearly influenced by Christianity. Yet visit South Korea and you may think Buddhism is the religion of the land. There are temples virtually everywhere. Almost a quarter of the Korean population define themselves as Buddhists. Yet how can we explain Buddhism's seeming lack of power and influence in shaping contemporary Korean politics and society? Why are there no strong Buddhist political parties or charismatic Buddhist leaders shaping the agenda? To find answers, we sat down with Seoul National University professor Sem Vermesh and took a long, hard look together at Buddhism in Korea from its introduction from China in the 4th century to our modern times. Professor Vermesh studied Korean at Seoul National University and received his PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. He completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Korea Institute of Harvard University and joined the faculty of Seoul National University in 2008, where he also serves as Associate Director for the International Center of Korean Studies. In addition to several academic publications, Professor Vermesh is the author of The Power of the Buddhas, The Politics of Buddhism During the Koryo Dynasty, published by Harvard University Press for which he was awarded the James B. Palais Book Prize by the Association of Asian Studies in 2010. Professor Vermesh, welcome to Korea and the World. How did you become an expert in Korean Buddhism, and what is so fascinating about Buddhism as practiced in the Korean Peninsula? What struck your interest there? Well, the story that I always tell is is the following one. I actually started out in Chinese studies in Belgium in the late 80s, because the story then was China is the future. So if you learn Chinese, your future will be secured. And I believe that. And uh, maybe now it's starting to become reality. But but anyway, I graduated in 1990. And that was, of course, the year after Tiananmen. So when I would normally have come to the market for Sinologists, all the connections with China were severed. And I still took, you know, took out my own money and went to China for a year because all the scholarships were, you know, uh, stopped. There was nothing. So I went to China, but it was very difficult because, as I just mentioned, all channels or exchange had been interrupted. So they, I still don't know why, but they st- sent me to um, in a very small provincial university in Anhui. So small city of 500,000 where there were, uh, I think, six or seven foreigners, which were all the foreign students. So me one German and five Egyptians. And so I studied there Chinese for a year. But um, when doing, when traveling around the city, there, there are some famous Buddhist mountains. And one of them is called Jiu Hua Shan, the Nine Flower Mountains. So I went there, of course, and you know, climbed the whole mountain and then discovered that it was actually a place to venerate a certain Bodhisattva, kind of Buddhist saint, named in Chinese Dizang. So that's the Bodhisattva who is specialized in saving beings from hell. Uh, But actually what they believed there was that that Bodhisattva uh, had come from Korea. So it was a Korean person who had traveled to China and later became worshipped as the incarnation of that Bodhisattva. And I found that very interesting. You know, how could a Korean come to China and be worshipped so much that people thought he was a bodhisattva because usually it's very difficult for a foreign person in, an, in a new country to get that kind of uh, recognition. recognition. Yeah. Yeah. So that was like, I, I, I could call it the germ, the, the, the first thing that, or the first encounter that put the idea into my mind to study Korean Buddhism. Of course, I didn't start right away then saying I want to, but that was like the first kind of snowball that put it in motion I guess so after the year was up in uh, in China I returned to Belgium but there was still no kind of improvement in relations so then I looked at the catalog they had a kind of booklet of the Flemish government for all the study abroad programs and I noticed of course China was not an option but they had Korea and I said let's try Korea <laughs> Why not? <laughs> and and basically, there was not not many people interested in Korea at the time, so I ended up being selected, and I came to Korea. Uh, first studied the language, and then I wanted to do graduate studies, 
And then I remembered that encounter I had in China. I said, well, why not study Buddhism? Uh, that sounds like an interesting topic to study. So that's how it, how it started. So then uh, I did one year uh, of language study here at Seoul National University. And then I enrolled in the master's program at the Academy of Korean Studies, where I did one year of uh, graduate studies. But then, of course, the problem was there was not a lot of Korean Buddhism at that school. So it was not a good choice for learning about Buddhism. So after a year, I gave up, went back to Europe and enrolled at the University of London because it was much easier to study about things in English <laughs> than you know, doing it in, in Korean. So what is so fascinating about Buddhism as practiced in the Korean Peninsula? I know it's a very difficult question, but can you maybe define what we mean when we talk of mm -hmm. Korean Buddhism mm -hmm. for someone who doesn't know much about mm -hmm. Buddhism as such? Mm -hmm. Well, to, to be perfectly honest, at first I was not really interested in Buddhism because when I was in Belgium, I wanted to study Chinese, but my professor just happened to be a specialist in Buddhism. And I really didn't like it at all. Um, maybe that's a strange confession uh, to make, but uh, I guess it was just the way it was presented, because we, we, we read Buddhist texts, and Mahayana texts are very boring. They're extremely large texts, and they're very expensive. Not expensive, expansive. They, they paint like a picture of the universe, of, of a huge universe with many different worlds, thousands of worlds, and in each world there's a different Buddha, and in each world, the Buddha is preaching to vast congregations, so something like that. So I found that very boring. But when I traveled to China, I actually saw on that holy mountain that people were actually practicing Buddhism. And I was very surprised at first because I had the image of China being a communist country, uh, so very secular, uh, not interested in religion. And I saw something completely different. I saw people actually going on pilgrimage. That was in 1990 that showed me a completely different picture of Buddhism and that really made me interested in wanting to study it not as an abstract thing but as something that has an impact on people's lives so anyway um, I, I came to it very gradually and I was always interested more in how Buddhism interacts with uh, society with history rather than Buddhism uh, for itself I, I don't have an affinity for meditation, for example. So when I started to study Korean Buddhism, it, it's very much for the same reasons, because if you travel around, you see there are temples everywhere. Uh, if you go to a museum, you see it's full of Buddhist artifacts. So that is that is what really got me going, you know, the, the fact that it's everywhere in history. I wanted to fi find out, you know, what are the roots of this. You speak about the roots in history, Korean Buddhism played a very important political role. Is that correct? Whereas nowadays it's not the case. We'll talk about that later. Can you maybe explain how Buddhism came to Korea and what was the role that Buddhism played in terms of politics, in terms of unifying the, the peninsula maybe? In a nutshell, Korea received Buddhism through China, uh, through diplomatic contacts with China especially. And it seems to have been the case that a religion can spread naturally simply by people spreading as missionaries, going to other countries as missionaries. But what happened in the case of China and Korea is that uh, the Chinese emperor sent an embassy to Korea. Uh, of course, an embassy was not something between two equal countries, but of a suzerain, a higher country, granting something to a lower country. So it seems that Buddhism came with that diplomatic package of a higher country granting something to a lower country. Can you so maybe basically. situate that um, in historical terms? Are we talking about the 4th century, 5th century? Uh, yes, that's. Mm. I, I'm trying to keep out the yeah, historical yeah, yeah, yeah. details as much as possible. But yes, that's the 4th century mm. AD. So the, the official date of the first granting of Buddhism by one of these Chinese countries is, I think, 372 AD. That was the, the official start of Buddhism in Korea. So it was very much uh, a process between the rulers. So the Korean king, the Kokoro king at the time, accepted the mission and sponsored the first monks. He built a temple and so forth. So initially it seemed something that found uh, especially attraction among the ruling class. Whether ordinary people believed in Buddhism, we know, we know very little about that. So it's very interesting that kings were very much attracted by Buddhism from, from the beginning. And it seems like they saw in there something that could help them in centralizing their authority, in basically showing that they're a king, 
and that they have the authority, the power to rule over people. That is a kind of common thread, I think, not just because at that time, of course, the Korean Peninsula was split into three kingdoms. So each in turn received Buddhism and each in turn did the same thing. They sponsored Buddhism and they used it to strengthen their authority. So Korean kings would use Buddhism as a way to legitimize their rule. Exactly, yeah. And the best documented part of that is, of course, the kings of Silla, who received it a bit later in the 6th century. And very soon after deciding to sponsor Buddhism, they became very devout Buddhist kings. Um, so they even took on Buddhist names. In one case, we know that a Buddhist king gave his sons the name of a Chakravartin ruler. So a Chakravartin is a, a Buddhist king, somebody who bases his rulership on Buddhism. So evidently they, they went very far in uh, identifying with Buddhism, in uh, using it to present themselves as Buddhist kings. Is it also correct to say that Buddhism brought a uh, proto-form of bureaucracy to Korea? Well, what happened is, I left that out of the picture, but Buddhism, of course, never didn't come alone. It came with Chinese culture, it came with Confucian culture. So, of course, at the time in the 6th century, the picture is very blurred. We, we don't really know, you know whether, for example, the kings at the time, whether they accepted uh, Confucianism as well. But very likely, everything came together. So we have the most information about Buddhism at the time, but there was also Taoism and Confucianism. So it was never kind of exclusive belief in, in Buddhism alone. That is, I think, what people often forget because they say, well, Koryo and Shila was uh, Buddhist, but that is not, that is not completely correct. Yeah. Because we actually see only for a very short period that kings were very much into Buddhism. So it was only the sixth century. And after that, they switch much more clearly to Confucian Chinese model of presenting them as kings, so basing themselves basically on the mandate, the mandate of heaven to rule. And after that you see a kind of mixture, you know, uh, Buddhism exists, but more or less in the background to show the external legitimation symbols, symbolism. But in the documents, of course, they always present kings as very much in, in the same manner as Chinese kings, so based on the on the mandate, you know, Confucian norms and virtues, that makes it always very complicated to to say exactly it's this or that. Professor Vermesh, you mentioned Confucianism. At the end of the uh, Koryo dynasty, there were a lot of troubles, um, Mongol invasions, uh, military coups, generally, a, I would say, a deliquescence of the regime, and this is where we see the rise of neo-Confucianism that denounces Buddhism very heavily. Can you maybe expand on that and explain what happened? Well, first of all, as I just mentioned, Buddhism never existed in a vacuum. So it was maybe only for a very short period that Buddhism was dominant at the political level. But after, you know, even throughout unified Shilla, Buddhism and Confucianism always coexisted. And especially after the foundation of Koryo in the 10th century, you, you actually see that they also adopt a Confucian program. Yeah. So they start to have, for example, the Confucian examination system. So throughout the Koryo dynasty, Confucian bureaucracy and what I call the Buddhist bureaucracy existed side by side. So you had a kind of system, what I call the, uh, the two wheels of Dharma. That is a term from Indian Buddhism. But it basically means that to each its own. So for example, in the temporal realm the king rules and in the spiritual realm the buddhists are superior so you can see that very nicely in the, in the cover of my book that i wrote the the power of the buddhas picture of the king the founder king of koryo actually who is shown paying his respects bowing to a buddhist monk and the buddhist monk is shown to be much bigger than him so that is something that you also find in indian culture is that if you want to show that the spiritual or the religious is more important, you show that by making the figure bigger. Yeah, so that shows very clearly that in the Koryo period, you know, spiritually, religiously, Buddhism was important. But at the same time, in the political world, that was Confucian. So you cannot say that, for example, as many people do, that Buddhism interfered in, in politics, for example. They didn't. Yeah. There was two very different tracks. One was for Buddhist monks could you know, take a special examination, go to temples and become abbots of temples. 
They also had a special administrative organ to supervise Buddhism. But that was completely separate from the Confucian track where you took the examination and then became a magistrate or a minister or high official. That was completely separate. Now what happened in the late Koryo period when of course uh, everything, especially after the Mongol invasions, everything started to collapse and also that division between the Buddhist and the Confucian track also collapsed. The most famous example of that is of course Shindon, uh, the famous corrupt monk who was given all the power uh, over government by King Kongmin. And of course that's true, he was a monk and he got you know, tremendous political power and he made a mess of things, but that, that is an exception. Before that, you know, something like this was completely inconceivable. But people have always used this, when I say people, that's primarily the Neo-Confucians of the Chosun dynasty, to say that, well, you know, Buddhism was corrupt, so we have to get rid of Buddhism, we have to replace that by something else. But the interesting thing is that people are still saying this after all, you know, after more than seven or eight centuries, uh, let's say seven centuries, they're still saying Buddhism was corrupt and therefore it needed to be replaced by something else. We don't really know. Of course there was corruption, but that's, that's a kind of very simplified picture. So you mentioned the rise of the Neo-Confucians in this transition between Koryo and Chosan. Mm -hmm. What happened to Buddhism there? It seems that Buddhism slowly got rejected as an underclass mm -hmm. and that they completely lost these two wheels as you mentioned. Well, the, the system of the two wheels was, was no longer recognized. Mm. You could say the two wheels came off the cart, <laughs> as, as you uh, seem to be saying in, in, in your metaphor. But I think what happened was that it was a very gradual process because Buddhism was, of course, everywhere. Buddhist temples were everywhere. There were temples even in the palace. So you couldn't just say, you know, we're going to get rid of it overnight. In China, that happened a couple of times and you had a huge repression of Buddhism. But in the Chosun dynasty, it was a very gradual process of supplanting Buddhist customs with Confucian ones. So it took centuries to actually completely remove Buddhism from the visual world. The first king of the Chosun dynasty was actually very pro-Buddhist. So it was very controversial that he actually wanted to simply continue to sponsoring Buddhism. And of course, the officials were very much against them. From the third king, King Taejong, they actually started, you could call the suppression of Buddhism. They started to confiscate the temples, make it make life very difficult. They were even banned from cities, right? Yes, from they Buddhism. were excluded from cities. Because the founder of the Chosun dynasty had built his own temples in the city, they couldn't, it was not very easy to remove them. Because if they would remove them, they would go against the wishes of the founding father. So actually they simply burned them. <laughs> Uh, secretly, I think, that's just an arson attack. So uh, by the 16th century, they were all gone from from the cities. And by that time, it was also almost impossible to become a monk in a legal fashion. You know, the legal system for allowing somebody to become a monk, because to become a monk, you need a certificate, actually, from the state. That has always been the case. Uh, so that system was gone. So people maybe became monk unofficially, but officially it was no longer possible. And so Confucianism became a de facto state-sanctioned compulsory ideology. Yes, exactly. Which was a major change in the religious background of Korea, since as you mentioned in the past, right, right, um, there was right. this you know mix of right, various... Yeah. You know. People often think that just as Confucianism rules every aspect of life, it was the same for the Buddhist era in Korea, but that is not that was not the case. So anyway, in Chosun, yes, Confucianism ruled everything, uh, family values, relations, how you can marry, how, how you can divorce or not divorce. Everything was regulated by Confucianism, by Confucian norms. But of course, uh, interestingly, Buddhism never was never completely suppressed. It always seems to have retained some level of popularity of attraction to people and I think one of the reasons for that is that Confucianism is very demanding not just of everybody but also of kings so they actually s try to remold the person in charge the king into an ideal Confucian model of virtue but that, that's very uh, difficult because kings had to listen to lectures about Confucianism they had to uh, listen to their ministers uh, they had 
to do all these kinds of things which were very kind of limiting. So we know that there were a couple of rulers such as uh, Yonsan Gun, it's the most famous example, who didn't take that advice. So I think for them, for kings, uh, Buddhism was always more attractive because Buddhism never had that kind of oppressive demands of kings and painted them in a much more positive light. So for example, in the mid 16th century, there was uh, a time, I forgot which king it was, but because he was a minor, his mother ruled for a period instead of him. And his mother was very much in favor of Buddhism. So in the mid 16th century, you had a kind of Buddhist revival. Uh, unfortunately, when that mother died, the queen dowager died, uh, of course, the suppression started again. And uh, the, the monks who had, for a brief period of time, had become rehabilitated, were now banished and killed. So it's the, the repression started again. We will fast forward a bit later um, to the Japanese colonization, but to stay in the 16th, 16th century, is it fair to say that Buddhism gained a lease of life, so to speak, in the Imjin Wars of 1592 because all the Confucian literati ran for their lives, mm -hmm. whereas the monks actually fought back and that somehow provided them with more legitimacy? Yes, exactly. So as I mentioned, in 1565, the Queen Dowager died and suppression of Buddhism started again. But in 1592, the Japanese Toyotomi Hideyoshi ordered the invasion of Korea. And uh, it was, of course, a huge, you know, the country was simply not prepared for, for this very sophisticated military force, uh, 200,000 soldiers, very well trained. So everybody just ran for their lives. The king also nearly took refuge into China. He, he just stopped short of the border. <laughs> of course, there were guerrilla leaders and also Buddhist monks actually took up arms and fought against you know, the Japanese. Uh, of course, they were too small in numbers and probably too poorly organized to do any major damage. But just the fact that they sacrificed their lives for the country and the king, that, that was, I think, very uh, important symbolically. Professor Vermesh, you brushed a, I would say, comprehensive political history of Buddhism in, in Korea. Let's fast forward now to the colonial period uh, and the impact of Japanese colonization on Buddhism. It seems that many Korean Buddhists actually welcomed, in a sense, Japanese uh, involvement because Japanese missionaries forced Korean authorities to open up the cities again to the Buddhists. Yes, that's right. Uh, if I can just add a little bit more history of to course, bridge of the course. gap from, <laughs> from your previous... <laughs> so after the Hideyoshi invasions, because of the merit established by the Buddhist monks who had fought against the Japanese, after the invasions, so in, in the 17th century, the policies against Buddhism were not reversed. Uh, they were still anti-Buddhist, but Buddhism was tolerated. In other words, nobody would confiscate temples any, anymore. So Buddhism was basically left to its own devices, but they were allowed to subsist in their temples. The temples were taxed; <laughs> they had to pay, you know, heavy taxes. But they could, you know, they could at least maintain themselves. So in the late 19th century, of course, very slowly, foreigners began to seep into the country, and of course, the Japanese were the most prominent among these. It's very interesting that we all know probably the story of how Catholicism came to Korea, how Western missionaries started coming in the 1880s. But actually the very first, uh, as soon as the treaty between Korea and Japan was inked in 1876, the year after already, the Japanese opened a Buddhist temple in Busan. So in, I think it was 1877. So very quickly the Japanese were here to spread their own forms of Buddhism. And uh, initially, they cooperated very well with the Korean Buddhist monks. And as you mentioned, there's a very famous example of a Japanese Buddhist monk who lobbied the Korean government to overturn the ban on Buddhist monks entering the cities. And that was, I think, in 1895. King Kojong allowed monks to open temples in, in Seoul to go into the city as monks. Before that, if they wanted to enter the city, probably they had to dress up and uh, disguise themselves as something different. So 1895, Buddhist monks were allowed to enter the cities and you know that allowed them to spread the Dharma again in the cities among the people. 
So initially they looked up very much to these Japanese monks. I mean, they ended a 400-year exactly, ban, so it's exactly. quite, quite something. Yes, yeah, so, the, so they were very, very grateful, actually. Not only that, but they also saw that Japanese Buddhist monks had apparently lots of influence. They had lots of financial means. They had apparently a very strong position in their own country. So Korean Buddhist monks basically wanted to follow the Japanese model and uh, learn about other cultures also through these Japanese uh, Buddhist monks. But of course there's a very famous case of the leader of the Korean Buddhism at the beginning uh, right before the colonial period so in 1909 1910 he made a secret pact with the Japanese so that Japanese and Korean Buddhism would kind of merge so that's a very famous case in Korean Buddhist history and of course up to that point there was a lot of goodwill amongst Korean Buddhists towards the Japanese but when it became known that he had concluded this secret pact and basically given up the identity of Korean Buddhism, that was a huge uproar and everybody was against. And that was a kind of turning point. So that was, of course, a time when Japan annexed Korea. So after that, all the goodwill basically disappeared <laughs> overnight and Korean Buddhism and Japanese Buddhism went again on different tracks. But there's a very, you know, there's a very interesting book by Kim Hwan Su called Empire of the Dharma that deals with this case in, in very great detail. And it shows that things are never as straightforward, of course, as, uh, as we usually think. Because we usually think that this person was a traitor. Yi Hui Guang sold out Korean Buddhism to Japanese. But actually, it was not that simple. And the Japanese, for example, were barely aware of the, <laughs> the, the attempts. You know, it was, it was not such a big thing as it was made out to be at the time. Of course, he shouldn't have done that. But it was not as drastic as people usually uh, imagine it to be. Japanese Buddhism, especially during the colonization period, had a huge impact on Korean Buddhism in terms of how the religion works especially in terms of celibate. Can you maybe explain what happened there? Celibacy, yes. Celibacy, yeah, yes. Yeah. What happened was, of course, uh, after the annexation of Korea, as I mentioned, relations between Japanese and Korean monks uh, cooled down substantially. But Japanese Buddhism still provided the model. So we have, for example, a very famous reformist, Han yong un who wrote a very famous tract on how to reform Buddhism. And one of the things that he proposed was let Buddhist monks become more sociable. And the way to do that, he said, was, well, let them marry, because that's the best way for them to become a part of society. Uh, if you marry and have kids, you know, you're automatically part of society. And of that went that, against Korean doctrine, right? Because in the well, past they used to remove themselves from society and that's exactly what the Confucians did not like about Buddhism. When you say doctrine, it, it's, it's not doctrine, it's, you know, Buddhism has its own code of conduct, the Vinaya. And of course, according to the Vinaya, you have to leave household life in order to become a monk, so you cannot marry. So that goes against mm. the Vinaya. But there was actually already a model in that Japanese Buddhists had already started the practice of marrying. You know, during the Meiji Reformation process. It's actually very interesting, you know, it, it's, it's very hard to imagine these days, but the kind of key ideology or the key kind of uh, concept, of popular concept at the, at the time was social Darwinism. So in order to survive, you have to become strong. You know, that's only the fittest will survive. And it's interesting that Buddhism absorbed that as well. So Japanese Buddhist monks actually started to eat meat at the time because they said, well, we want to be strong <laughs> to compete with Christianity. So they, they saw it very much as a competition with Christianity, with other religions. And so Han Yong un of course, his proposals may seem naive, but you have to see it in the context of the time when, you know, these ideas about social Darwinism and survival were dominant. And he just wanted to strengthen Korean Buddhism to help it survive into the 21st century, you know, to adapt it. So his ideas were never officially uh, accepted. I think there was most people said, are you crazy? Out of the question. But at the same time, they actually started to marry because they simply followed the model of the Japanese monks. And uh, it was not a policy or anything. Of course, at a certain time, the Japanese government general probably issued a regulation saying that they can marry officially. But it was simply a gradual process of monks seeing that this was not a bad way of living. <laughs> and by the end of the colonial period, 
think the majority of monks were married. But this brought also tremendous problems after liberation because there was a schism between those yes. who had yes. remained true to the right. Korean faith, so to right. speak. Can you right. maybe also elaborate on that? Again, it's, it's, it's a very complicated process because, of course, also during the colonial period, you had a small core group of conservative monks who were dead against this marriage practice and who wanted to prevent that at all costs, but they were a minority. But of course, after liberation, that minority was seen as the patriotic group. So even though they were the minority, they had the strongest voice. So they argued that Korean Buddhism had always been celibate and should remain celibate uh, in the future as well. So they were very keen to enforce this celibacy on all the monks, but the majority, of course, didn't accept that. So it was not easy in the beginning. So there was a kind of conflict between the married and the unmarried monks. But President Lee sung man actually sided with the conservative side. Right, uh, exactly. He, um, of course, he was a Christian president. And some people say that, you know, he wanted to play one group against the other. But in any case, he, he endorsed the celibate monks and that kind of gave them the credibility to start recovering the temples because that was what they actually had to do. The, the married monks were in the temples. They wanted to stay there. So <laughs> they had to use all kinds of means to, to recover the temples, even litigation, violence uh, happened, all kinds of things that you normally do not associate with Buddhism, you know, in this conflict between the married and the non-married monks. There were also very highly medi mediatized conflicts all the way to the 1990s. So this, this conflict between the, the conservative side and the Japanese side Actually, there was well, a struggle for many, many years. It's interesting that you call it the Japanized side. That, that's the I, official I'm, I'm, yeah, term. Yeah, quoting Lee sung <laughs> Right. <laughs> I say, you know, I think the, the official term is Wesek. Uh, but actually, I, I, I think it's not necessarily the case that if you marry, you're pro-Japanese. That, that's a gross simplification of the problem. But that is what happened. It was simply a division. You're married, means you're pro-Japanese. You're not married, means you're patriotic, you're authentic. Korean Buddhist. But one of the things that happened at the time was, of course, it's, it's very difficult to be specific about that because most of the information is be based on rumors, but it does seem to be the case that in order to boost their numbers, the celibate monks took in many people who would normally not have become monks. Including mobs. Just. That's that's what people say. I don't know <laughs> whether that's the case. Uh, I, I suspect that probably was the, was the case. You know, people say gangsters or people who wanted to escape justice, things like that. Um, I'm not sure to what degree that was the case, but things that shouldn't have happened uh, clearly did happen in the 50s and 60s. So that legacy, uh, of course, took a long time to get rid of that legacy because. When I first came to Korea in 1992, I stayed here from 1992 to 1994. And of course, Korea uh, at the time, people in the West in Belgium thought that Korea was still a developing country at the time. So they had a very negative image. And unfortunately, whenever Korea was in the news, it's either North Korea or it was monks fighting. <laughs> yeah. So you had these very, I think it was in 1994 when I was here, that the struggle between two groups, conservative and progressive monks, spilled out into the streets around Choge, Chogesa, so the main temple. So you had all these scenes of fighting monks spreading all over the world in, in the media. So that was very, I think that was a kind of wake up call for Korean Buddhism to say we, we cannot continue like that. And uh, fortunately, it has improved uh, tremendously after that. So we don't see these these kinds of things anymore. But I think, yeah, that was the result of the fact that, you know, people had just allowed monks in the temples who didn't become monk for religious reasons. And a lot of them were only interested in money. A lot of temples were very lucrative because they're in tourist regions. So we have to pay money to enter the national park. And a lot of these conflicts in the 1990s were simply about controlling. controlling sources of income. Sources of income, yes. Mm. Yeah. Moving to the contemporary period, do we see a resurgence of political Buddhism now that I would say the movement has been tamed and that all the issues of the post-war period have been more or less resolved? Do we see a slight tendency of a new assertive Buddhism? Well, first of all, when you say political Buddhism, I don't think there is such a thing as political Buddhism. There is, of course, in terms 
that some Buddhist groups, for example in Thailand or Sri Lanka, actually do play a political role. And also in Japan, for example, there's a Buddhist party, the Kometo, is actually a, a Buddhist political party, maybe one of the few countries that has those. As I said before, in, in Korean history, mostly Buddhism didn't actually play an active political role. It was always, you know, what they call Hoguk Pulgyo, protecting the state. So they effectively did that in uh, terms of military protection, in terms of symbolic protection through rituals, through legitimation. But it, it never really had uh, a strong political agenda. There was something like, I don't know, uh, say we have to cremate or something like that. <laughs> I, I, I cannot think of any examples of Buddhists actually pushing their own agenda into the political world. So I don't see that happening now either. But you are right, the profile of Buddhism is changing. So of course, in the late Trosan period, it was the lowest of the low probably among the butchers and slaves is the same or even below that in, from, according to some sources and basically Buddhism ever since has been trying to regain its respectability so Korean Buddhists are very sensitive I think towards their image so a very famous case that you probably remember when uh, Lee myung was president it was a huge demonstration by monks and the basic trigger was that maps published at the time had left out Buddhist temples. So they put out the churches on the maps, but not the temples. Small issues like that uh, were very were very upsetting to put it because they felt that they were being pushed away again, you know, kind of being ignored and, and uh, being suppressed in a, in a sense. So, so they're very, very sensitive towards such issues. So they're very keen to polish their image to represent Buddhism to the world. So I think, for example, the Temple Stay program is part of their effort to kind of regain their place in society because as you know uh, since the world cup in 2002 the temple state program has become very popular so it's open to everybody and a lot of people i think also foreign students from what i hear uh, maybe because they take my class in korean buddhism they feel forced <laughs> to do that i don't know but uh, a lot of people even if they're not interested in buddhism see it as see the temple state program as a kind of way of experiencing korean culture in a different way and i think that's exactly what the buddhists want because they they very strongly argue that buddhism is part of korean culture and it's something that you cannot ignore and the temple state program is a very nice platform to spread this connection between korean culture and buddhism because you go to the temple state program you don't learn you can learn of course about buddhism meditation and uh, all the kind of rituals that you have to perform. But you can also learn about paper making or tea drinking or other things that are not directly connected to Buddhism, but are more about Korean culture, experiencing Korean culture. But it seems Korean Buddhism is, in terms of politics, is more reactive than proactive. If you look at Korean politics, it's very much Christian led. Mm -hmm. Has there never been any, I would say, trigger that would push Buddhists to not just react, just that, just like in 2008 against Im Yong-bak, but actually get into politics and somehow provide balance? I, I don't see any uh, trend towards that. I think a, a huge proportion of members of parliament is Christian. The people who are self-proclaimed Buddhists in parliament are very few. So I think, on the one hand, Buddhists don't have access to the keys to power on the one hand and maybe if they're Buddhist they're not going to be very open about it in public life uh, that is still I think more or less the case but they're becoming more assertive and I think a good example of that is uh, is Pop Nyun I'm not sure exactly when he came to the fore but I remember a couple of years ago when An Chol Su became hugely popular and became a, a presidential, for, presidential yeah. candidate of course he withdrew in then went into politics again and then but I heard I always read that the person who actually suggested him to go into politics was Pom Yun so this monk and then I started to notice more and more about Pom Yun and uh, he's, he's a very interesting figure he, he doesn't belong to the mainstream I think he's the founder of a separate group called the Jong Jongto Society the Pure Land Society so he's very much an engaged person. He he. The Jongto Society runs all kinds of social welfare programs. They are active in developing countries. They send aid to other countries. They have a very prominent social platform, and I think in a sense that's still that sense from what I mentioned, Han Yong Un. Of course, he advocated 
to go to marry in order to go into society but Pomyun is showing I think that you can be socially responsible while also being a traditional monk and uh, so he's a very interesting figure uh, he has his very famous Chugmun Chukseol sessions where people can go to him with their problems and he gives answers and it's not necessarily strictly Buddhist answers it can be about problems with children who don't want to study or problems between spouses and, and he gives very straight very kind of undiplomatic <laughs> answers sometimes very so so yeah he seems to be a person who kind of has brought Buddhism out of its normal confines and into the public domain and I think he has captured the imagination and there are a couple of other monks as well who have started to gain a, so a larger platform of attention for example last year or two years ago it was uh, Hiemin who also wrote a very popular book you know with kind of Buddhist advice on, uh, on how to approach life but these monks are not political they're not um, political yeah. no no they're not pol I so to that extent they remain faithful so to speak to how Buddhism approaches politics yeah. right uh, I think Buddhism is still especially the Chogya order is, is still very patriotic that is still very clear about Korean Buddhism that they say we are Hogok Pulgyo so for example even if you become a monk you still have to do army service either before you become a monk or after you become a monk you still have to do army service they will not accept pacifism as an excuse or as a reason for not doing military duty because they put Hugo first. So in that sense, I, I guess you could say that's a political dimension still. But that's still passive in a sense. We defend the country. We're, we're here for defending the country. Professor Vermesh, we've been talking about Buddhism in Korea, but maybe we should also ask one fundamental question. Who's the Korean Buddhist in 2014? How do you define them? It's actually a very difficult question to answer because unlike... Catholic churches or Protestant church I mean if you're baptized then you're part of the religious community and then that, that's very straight but Buddhism has traditionally been uh, very open in, in Korea so you just go to a temple if you feel the need to if you're in trouble and you want to organize a ritual you go to a temple and then for maybe a few years after you don't go <laughs> so in that case are you Buddhist or not that that's a very tricky question and also very very important is that there has been a lot of identity confusion between Buddhists and shamanists in that, for example, a lot of shamans, people who are clearly shamans, who do shamanist rituals, who get possessed, who predict the future, pose as Buddhists. You know, they call them bosarlim, bodhisattva. They use Buddhist symbols for their shops. And in the public as well, there's a lot of confusion traditionally. You know, people think of monks more as kind of these people with the unique capacity to understand people or to predict the future even or to say whether marriage will fail or not <laughs> rather than people who are on the path to enlightenment yeah so traditionally this has been called kibok pulgyo so kibok means praying for blessings and that has been seen as something very negative in other words people don't turn to buddhism for salvation but only for pre personal benefit of course, that is that is something that happens. You know, people sometimes turn to religion for very you know, personal reasons, not, you know, for what you would expect. Um, and I think that is still the case that, you know, if you go to a temple, you will still see about a couple of months before the date of the entrance examination, you will see that there's a 100-day prayer to help your children get into good school, to get a good score in the examination. At the same time, I think there is also a trend to try and go to back to the source of Buddhism. So what the biggest, the Chogya order is doing, for example, is they have implemented since a couple of years a registration system so that people now uh, have actually a temple where they are affiliated with and that they also get instruction in Buddhism. So that they, had, they have something, I wouldn't call it a, a catechesis but a kind of training that they know the fundamentals about Buddhism and that they can understand it on a more kind of advanced level so that is something but it's it's very hard to say this is the typical Korean Buddhist because you have at the one end of the spectrum you have still maybe the older Halmoni or Ajuma who just goes to temple for praying and then you have younger intellectuals who are more 
into mindfulness and meditation to calm and you know to get a good job or something or to to relieve stress so you have all those people and it, it's, it's very hard to say this is the the korean buddhism because it's become very diverse not just in terms of the people but also in terms of groups because you have the Chogya order as the biggest korean buddhist group but you also have a huge amount dozens of smaller buddhist groups that are all kind of striving <laughs> in hmm. the, the religious marketplace so to say and, uh, to trying to gain attention from people so it's very difficult to say in which direction you know it will go in the future i think it's hard enough to keep track of with what's going on right now that's what i'm yeah, trying to do to conclude is it fair to say that this identity this complex identity as you just mentioned explains maybe why there is no political Buddhism because there is no normative, strong normative belief, just like in Christianity, that then can be used as a political platform. You know, I have to be honest, it's a question I haven't thought about really hard. I, I think it's just the kind of path that Buddhism finds itself on. It hasn't, traditionally, it hasn't engaged in, in politics. And unless there's somebody to turn direction, I, I don't see any reason to, to change that. Professor Vermesh, thank you very much for being our guest today and for your insights. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.